share my screen. And by the way, if you guys have any suggestions of how, you know, if you would like to see different things in these, you can always let me know. I'm always open for suggestions. Um, okay, let's get loopy because that's what we're talking about this week. We are talking about the ability to make decisions repeatedly, the same decision over and over again, but with different outcomes based on different data because that's what looping is about. So this is the first time we're really going to talk about code reusability. Up until now, everything's been in a straight line, maybe with a few bumps, a few speed bumps based on the if, else, and else from last week. But it's all been in a straight line. This week, we are going to learn how to reuse code by putting it in a loop. Um, looping is an extension of what we did last week of branching. So the same rules of local and global scope apply, and we will talk about them a little more. Um, and by reusability, I am not talking about copying and pasting. I am talking about using loops and functions to reuse code, and we're going to get into functions next week. Um, why is reusability so important, and why is it my favorite topic in programming? Um, there's an analogy, and the analogy goes like this. If you find a, a problem in when you're talking about what your requirements are, it'll cost you a dollar to fix. If you find it when you're designing whatever your system's going to be, it's going to cost you $10 to fix. If you don't find it till you're coding, that same problem is going to cost you $100 to fix. And if you don't find it till you get to the customer site, it's going to cost you $1,000 to fix. And that, that is an analogy that tells you how asymptotically high the, the effort goes to fix a bug when it's in code. If I can find a way to have my code do exactly what I want it to do and reduce the amount of code I write, I am saving myself from having to sit there and scratch my head and wonder what I did. I'm saving the company. And I get paid to program. That's what I do for a living. I do some other things, but that's my basic job. And the company that pays me relies on me to be able to understand how to structure code so that it's usable and reusable. So this is our first foray into learning how to do that. So we got some new keywords this week. We're going to have while, that's a type of a loop, for, that's another type of a loop, and there are reasons you have two different types of loops. A while loop is based is um, based on user input within the loop. A for loop is based on the fact that you have a finite list. That list could be a dictionary. That list could be all kinds of things. But it's a you have a finite collection that you're working over. And that collection can just be a bunch of numbers. It can be go from one to ten but it is still finite. It still has a beginning and an end. A while loop doesn't necessarily have an end. You have to tell it when to end. Now you can write them so that they have an end, but if I know something has an end, if I know that my data is finite, which most data is, I always use the loop uh, made for that kind of problem, and that's a for loop. I write many more for loops in my uh, in my programming life than I do while loops. In, in is, a, is, is something, is a keyword you use with a for loop to figure out if some value is present in your collection. So you don't have to do anything fancy. All you have to do is say, is this value or the value of this variable present in this collection? And to do that, you use the word in. Now, there are also ways to stop a loop before it's reached its natural conclusion. 
Uh, there's the break keyword, which halts the loop. It basically just stops whatever loops you're in and goes to the next line of code that is in the next outer scope, because we're going to deal a little bit this week with, um, I, think, I think one of our labs has a nested loop. I'll double check that, though. And then continue says stop what you're doing and go back and reevaluate. Go back up to the top of the loop, reevaluate the expression, and start again. So those are our new keywords for this week. Um, we have a couple of concepts. We have the concept of an iteration. And an iteration is one trip through a loop. And I'll explain that and give you some demonstrations of what I mean. A sentinel value is the value that's checked to determine if the termination condition of the loop is met. Now, for loops and while loops both have um, checks, but the while loop is where you're really going to use the sentinel value. And by the way, and I'm going to say this a lot over the next couple of weeks, while is the loop you need to loop type you need to use for your project. We have two kinds of loops, what I already said, while and for. Um, while evaluates it an unknown number of times. For has to have a finite number, a known number of times. Now, could you do a while loop against a known number of elements? Absolutely. You could write it like that. It will be more succinct, and you will write less code if you use a for loop for anything that's finite. So we're going to start with while loops. This is the basis of a while loop. First of all, let's talk about what I have here. I have two variables, cur power and user care. User care is the variable that I am going to check within the loop. Actually, in the loop statement. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to check that. It has to be defined outside the loop. User care is not like, um, it, you'll find in for loops you can define something in the statement. This you can't define it in the statement. It has to be predefined and it has to have a value. Because if it doesn't, you'll never get into your while loop and it won't work. Um, user care also will be changed within the loop. So you're going to say, okay, now give me some more input, and you're going to do that inside the loop so that every time you go back up to where the while statement is, which I call the top of the loop, so whenever you go back up to the top of the loop, it will have a new value, and you will do a, basically a new evaluation of whatever the statement is. While, the while keyword, tells Python that you're going to take an unknown number of iterations. So whatever is in the code block, whatever in the local scope of that while loop, is going to be executed until somebody tells you not to. And there's a way to write while loops where they never end. And in some cases, you don't want them to. If you may have timers, you may have things that do threading resources. Those things you usually don't want to end. You want to let them go and then have a, um, a condition inside them that breaks, that just stops everything. Um, in this case, y is a sentinel value. So what are we doing here? We are saying, hey, Python, run the local scope code until user care is equivalent to y, until some use, someone puts in a lowercase y. Remember, Python is case sensitive, so if you've got a lowercase y there, you have to put in a lowercase y to stop it. Um, the while statement can be read as long as a user is equivalent, as user care is equivalent to y, keep going. Um, don't forget the colon. Just like with an if statement, you have to have the colon at the end of the for loop or sorry, the end of the while loop and at the end of a for loop, but at the end of a while loop, or you're going to get a syntax error. It's a problem. 
So a sentinel value is a, va a sentinel is a value which defines the exit condition for the loop. That's how you're going to get out of the loop. Okay, a little bit more about while loops. So um, the con entry the entry condition is the condition under which you enter the loop. So if I said user care equal n, but my while statement is user care is equivalent to y, I would never get in to the while loop. So user care, if it's equivalent, if you're doing not equivalent, it's a different story. But if you're using the double equal sign, then you have to make sure that your uh, your variable that you're using to test has the right value to allow you to enter into the loop or you'll just it just will skip over it and we can look at that um, and don't forget the colon I said that earlier so down there where user care is green I have user care equal input this is the point at which you can change the outcome of what happens in the loop because the value of user care will be changed by default. It's going to it's equal input. You're going to have to put something in. When we go back up to the top of the loop, user care is going to be different. It may be Y. It may be something else other than Y. But it will change the condition and, the, and you may exit the loop based on that. Now, this is a very small example for your project. I will always check that you have an ability to exit out of your while loop. Whether it's a queue, whether it's the word exit, I'm going to check that you have a way to stop the game before it's finished. Um, so I think I've got everything here. Okay, so let's follow the user care value and then we're going to do it again in PyCharm. So here's my script same script we saw in the last two slides. Over here on the left hand side I've got my computer storage, the name of my variables, and the values. Now let's see what happens. User care is Y. So while this is true because this is this is an this is a conditional statement. So it has to evaluate to true before you go inside the loop. So it's going to in Inside the loop, it's going to print whatever curve power is, and then it's going to go and ask you, do you want to keep going? And we go back up to the top of the loop at that point. A first iteration is complete. I put in Y, so I'm now going to re, I'm going to go through the rest of the loop again. So now I'm at four because curve power equals curve power type two. Now the user puts in no, and look at what happens. Iteration two is complete. User care is no, so use n is not equal to y, and I'm done. The minute the condition for the loop evaluates to false, you're done, period. Um, and the value of curve power changes and the value of user care changes. So that's just a little visual example on how to go through a loop. And I want to emphasize again that the same rules apply for while and for loops that did for if elif statements. You can do the between stuff, you can do not equal, all the Boolean operators, all the relation operators work with while and for loops. Um, okay. All right, we're going to look at challenge 421 in PyCharm. Uh, 421. Okay, so here's our curve power, and actually, I'm going to add a line here. Done. So when I look at this, I see um, local scope here under the while loop. So let's just run through this real quick, and then I'm going to break it like I broke stuff last week. So you can see what happens when it breaks and you can know where to fix it. So I am here. I am, I think I hit the debugger. Yeah, I'm in the debugger. Why didn't it debug it again? 
I don't know why it does that. All right, let's try and stop and rerun this. Is that the right debugger? Step through. All right. Oh, I'm stepping through the wrong thing. That would be my fault. Okay, let's do this. 421. Now let's try it. Okay, so I'm on line four. We know from the PyCharm debugger that it has not been executed yet. I'll just make that teeny bit smaller. And so what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here is I'm going to evaluate user car, which is Y, against Y. Now, again, if I'm in PyCharm, I can always mouse over the Boolean uh, operator. Sorry, the relational operator, not the Boolean operator and figure out what it's going to be. So I know this is going to be true. So if I step over, I'm going to, on the console, it's going to print out cur power, which is 2. It's going to multiply cur power by 2. If I go back to my debugger, I can see cur power is now 4. Now I'm going to step over, and I'm not going to go, even though I'm on the last line of this inner scope, this local scope, I'm not going to go to line 8. I'm going to go back up. Sorry, not yet. It's waiting for input. So I'm going to do Y again. So I've input Y. I step over, and now I'm back at the top of the loop. I have not yet hit line 8. And I haven't hit line 8 because I haven't exited the loop. So if I go back to the debugger, I'm going to do all this stuff again, it's going to ask for user input. If I go to the console, it print it four. It's going to ask for user input, and I'm going to type Mississippi just because I wanted to. Okay, so now user care is Mississippi. I'm going to step over. Mississippi is not the same as a lowercase y. So now what happens is this evaluates default. That expression does, and I'm going to step over, and now I get to line 8. So you'll notice that I hit that while loop a couple of times. I hit that while statement at twice, well, three times, 1, 2, and 3, because the third one evaluated defaults before I ever get to line 8. So that is what a loop does. You can repeatedly make the same decision. Now, if we look forward to our game, what you're going to do is you're going to have probably the first line right under your while loop. You're going to have something that asks for user input. You're going to ask for the direction. And then you're going to use that direction to change the current room, to make available different things potentially that the user has to scoop up and carry with them through the game. But this is the basic form that you'll use. Um, so let's do a couple of things. Let us start by making this n. Now, who thinks I'm actually going to make it into this loop? Because I don't think I'm going to make it into the loop. So I have a user care is n. User care is n, and it is not the same as y. So what's going to happen? I'm going to go straight to done. It's that simple. And then I am done. Now, here's something else. I could do this. I could do a not equal here. Oops, a not equal. Let me put the right character and say as long as it's not equal to quit, I keep going. So I just changed how the loop works. The default before was stop. Just stop as soon as you have to. This one is keep going. Just keep going until somebody types in the word quit. Keep going. So let's just run this real quick and see what happens. User care is n. n is not equal to quit. So I'm going to roll through here and then I'm going to put in a user care. And this time I'm going to type in Mississippi again. And I type in Mississippi. 
and this time user cares Mississippi, but I'm evaluating it using a not equal sign, which means that this still evaluates to true. And then I'm going to do it again, and I'm going to put in 42, and I'm just going to keep going here. So now I've decided I want to be done. So now when I decide I want to be done, I click, and I'm done. So this time I'm done because um, user care was equal to quit. So that evaluated default. So when it comes to your game, you're going to want to use the not equal. So not equal to quit, not equal to exit, not equal to queue, anything like that. That's what you're going to want to use. Now, let's do this. Let's do that and that. Let's just say I got my stuff wrong. So, and I'm going to step through this because if not, it'll never end. So I'm going to, the only thing I've done is I've moved six and seven out into the global scope. So let's see what happens. Well, I'm going to go to the console and user care is not quit. So I'm going to print two and user care is not quit. And I'm going to print two and user care is not quit. And this could go on forever because this is an infinite loop. This is a logic error that will cause you to have an infinite loop. And the logic error is you don't have the right things inside your local scope to control your loop. Now what will happen in Zybooks is you'll get something called a timeout error. I'm not going to run this in PyCharm because it'll just chew up all my RAM and my CPU after a long period of time. But Zybooks will give you a timeout error. It will detect that you have um, an infinite loop and it will shut it down. But it won't tell you you had an infinite loop. It will tell you you had a timeout error. So make sure that inside your while loop, because it's not finite, that you may you give the user or Zybooks the ability to change the outcome of the loop by making sure you have an input statement inside the loop. And that that input statement is set, the value from that input statement is set into the variable that is used in the loop statement itself. So, that, those are the gotchas. And does anybody have any questions? Okay. So we're now going to do this little thing called counting with while. And I do this because I want you to see the difference in how a while loop and how a for loop is going to work. If I, if I look here, I have num printed is zero and I have num stars is int input, which is fine. And then I'm going to say while num printed is less than num stars. Now here is a condition where I don't have to actually ask the user anything because it's finite. I know the number of stars that I want to print out. And so what I do is I don't have to ask the user anything. I just let it go. So Let's see, and there's there's four lines. There's four minimum lines here. I could have said num stars equal four or something. So I have to have num printed. I have to have the while loop. I have to have the print statement. And I have to have the thing that increments the my counter, the one that says this is how many have already been printed. Don't print any more. So it knows not to print more. So if I say I want to do three, user care is three, Num printed starts out at zero. It's going to print a star. And then, oh, my arrows are backwards. Sorry, it's going to increment num printed. Now, num printed is the value that it's going to check. So it's saying, okay, is num printed less than um, my number of stars? And I put in three. So I have zero, one, and two. And now I'm at three. And once I get to three, I stop because I started at zero. 
that's all fine and good. And you can count with while all you want. I prefer to count with a for loop. This does the exact same thing, except it says num is. That's it. That's all you have to do with a for loop. So if you have, I just saved two lines of code. If you have a finite set, you can use this. You can use a for loop, and it's much easier. And since most people were, most people in my line of work that, that I know of work with finite sets. They work with things that come from a database or something along those lines. Or they work with scientific calculations. Um, but, so you, I use a for loop a lot. However, if you're doing gameplay, if you're going to be a gamer, a game programmer, you're probably going to be inside of a huge while loop. So let's talk a little bit about the basics of a for loop. So I have four. Four is a keyword that tells Python to make a decision. Now, um, num, you'll, no, you'll notice there's just this word num there. Num is the name of a variable. And it could be any variable name. It doesn't have to be num. It could have been x. It could have been Lisa. It could have been, you know, yellow. It doesn't matter. It's just, as long as it is a valid variable name, it's all it cares about. Then I have the new keyword in. And this says, hey, Python, expect a sequence to the right of me. So to the left of in is the word num. That's a variable. And to the right is this thing called range. Range is a function. We're going to have a whole slide on it in a few minutes. But range provides you a sequence of numbers. And it will do the calculations, and it will create the numbers. You just have to tell it what you want. And that's nice because I can put a variable. It doesn't have to be three. It could be some variable that's been calculated a while ago. Um, the for statement can be read as long as num is in the sequence of numbers, keep going. And then under the for loop, indented one, is the print. It's going to say num is and then prints out the number. So. We still have a variable that we're going to check, just like we did with the while loop. I do not have to define that variable outside the scope of the loop. I have one that can be defined in the scope of the loop. And that variable num is only available in the local scope of the loop. It is not, it is not available in the global scope or any other scope that is greater. So for us, it would most likely be the global scope. So you didn't have to, excuse me, you didn't have to define it out of there, but you can, you have more restrictions on it. So while you define it before the while loop, and if you define it in the global scope, it's a global variable. For, you don't define it outside, you define it on the loop. And that makes it more restricted. So you can only use it in the local scope. Um, let's see. I talked about the special variable. Range is the special function we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And um, like all conditional statements, for has to end with a colon. But you can see that just in our simple example, we, re we, we wrote less code in a for loop. And that's why one of the reasons I use for loops more, but it's also because I use finite data. Okay, let's talk a little bit about range. Range is a function. We've used functions before. We've used print, we use input, we used int, we've used functions. Range is a little different. Um, first of all, range has a specific purpose, and that is to uh, and it's used within. Usually I use it with in. I don't think that I have an example where I don't use it with the word keyword, keyword in. Um, and range has a different structure than some of our other programs. 
print, we have used variable arguments because I can put in just like a string or I can put in a string and then comma and then end equal quote space quote or whatever's in those quotes. So print is takes what they call variable arguments. Range also takes variable arguments and there are three arguments. And you're saying, but wait a minute, on the left hand side of this slide you have range with one argument. That's correct because there's only one required argument. There are two arguments that are optional. You don't have to put them there and if you don't, they'll both be zero or so that one will be zero and one will be one. So, um, and this is nice because you can set range up to count backwards or to only count the odd numbers or only count the even numbers. You can do all that with just those three arguments. But you only have to use the one that says stop. And when you use that, it's going to stop at one minus. Because remember, we're starting, everything starts at zero. Everything. And your sequence is going to start with zero unless you tell it to start someplace else. So if you say, okay, I want I'm going to say range of three, you're going to have zero, one, and two as the numbers in that collection. That's it, zero, one, and two. Which means if you went to three, you'd get four things. So it's always the stop minus one, which will be the number. Now we have start and we have increment. Start lets you start at some place other than zero. Maybe you want to start at one. Maybe you want to start at two and only increment every two so you only get uh, even numbers because that's what increment does. Increment is by default set to one and you don't have to tell it. Python knows it's a default that's set to one. But maybe you don't want to increment at one. Maybe you want to increment at two or maybe you're going backwards and you want to increment minus one. Because you can start this, I could start this at 10, stop at 0, and increment by minus 1, and I would count backwards. So those are the types of things you can do with range. Now, let's follow the number. I have 4 num in range 3. So I know I'm going to have uh, numbers 0, 1, and 2. So let's see what happens here. We don't need the teacher, by the way. Python is just going to run this. When it hits range, it's going to basically create a list. It's 0, 1, and 2. It's going to assign num is originally going to be 0, and I'm going to print num is 0. Then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop, and I'm going to change num to 1. It does this all for me. I don't have to increment. I don't have to do anything. Then it's going to take the 2, and it's going to make num 2. And then the collection is empty. So I'm done. So that's how a for loop works. It just pulls each one out of the range until it's done, until there's nothing left. So um, a little bit more about range. So let's 461. I want to create a list which begins with 1 and contains every other number until 5 is reached. So it's only going to print out odd numbers between 1 and 5, inclusive. So how do I write this? This certainly has more than a single number in this. And what I do is I say I'm going to start at 1. I don't want to start at 0. I want to start at 1. Now, I want to print out five things, so I have to tell it that my end, my second argument in range, is one plus the number, because it still thinks, hey, you're starting at zero. So I gotta tell it where to end. And I gotta tell it correctly where to end. And you can know that by the stop is always one minus. So if I have six, it means it's going to end with the fifth number. 
And then I want to increment by 2 because I only want the odd numbers. And so if I do this, Again, no teacher needed. It's just going to go out and it's going to, it's going to create the right kind of, it's going to put 1, 3, and 5. That's what it's going to do. It's going to start the value at 1. It's going to say for print num is, so it's going to print that out. And then it's going to go back up to the top. It's going to say 3. It's going to print that out. And then it's going to say Five, and it's going to print that out. So that's how you modify it. So then we have nested loops. Before we go to nested loops, because there's a lot going on with nested loops, I'm going to go and we're going to do a, okay, okay. All right, let's do this one. Because this is kind of getting us a little closer to what we're going to be doing. Now, first of all, this is a dictionary. We don't get to dictionaries until week six. So I don't know why they give you a challenge. But what we're doing here is we are going to do a for loop over a sequence that's not numbers. Okay? So I won't use range. I will do, use a pre-created sequence. In this case, it's a dictionary. So let's do this. Come on. Okay, sorry about that. Got a little big. Let's move this over some. So I have contact emails. I got my list of emails. I want to add a new contact and a new email and... I don't know why they're doing it. And then they're going to go over uh, contact emails. I don't know why that they're having you put things in. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't make, sorry, I was writing Java today. There we go. We're just going to roll over that list. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here. And this is which number? 425. So I'm going to change this to 425 or 452. 452. Dyslexia is my friend. And then we're going... Now, we are in... We're about to step into our for loop. Contact is nothing yet because we haven't stepped over. But contact emails is that dictionary. So, but contact is nothing. If I look at my console, sorry, if I look at my debugger, there is no contact. The minute I step over that four line, contact is Sue Ryan, Sue Rain. So, I step over my print statement. My print statement's just going to print out the email is, and then the contact, and then I go back up to the top of the loop, and I set contact again to the next element in the list. So I had Sue Rain, I think that is. Now I have Mike Filt, and I'm going to print that out. And then my third one, as soon as I step over that for loop and actually execute it, is going to be Nate Artie. And I'm going to print that out, and then I'm going to be done. So this is using a finite collection that isn't about numbers. And this is, this is uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that in this week's stuff. But let's look at 681. So this is 681. So I could do this. Actually, I don't think. Let me know if you want to go over the pie charm for this because we just went over it in the slides and it's 945 and I haven't even started multidimensional loops. So if you want me to come back and go over that one, I will, but I'm going to talk about nested loops. Just like if statements, you can have 
loops inside loops inside loops and it doesn't matter you can start with a for loop and then have a while or you can start with a while loop and then have a for loop but what you have to do is you have to understand the flow of these um, loops because there's a very specific flow once you get to the innermost loop that loop has to finish before you go to the next statement in the outer loop so let me show you what I mean here I just have rows equal input number of rows I have columns equal number of columns now when we talk about lists in week six I'm going to mention a matrix a multi-dimensional array well that's what for loops and in outer and inner for loops are meant to if you've ever seen a spreadsheet that's what you're doing it's a matrix so um, if I start out I have rows and columns is two and two now rows and columns isn't going to change my outer loop because I have two is going to be zero and one so outer is going to equal zero and then I'm going to go to the inner loop and the inner loop is also going to be zero and one and now my inner variable is going to be zero so I'm going to print a star with an end of space and then I'm going back up to the inner loop inner for loop not the outer one I will then print another star when I'm done with the inner loop I'm going to print a new line and then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop at which point outer becomes one I'm going to then hit the inner loop and that's going to become one I'm sorry that's going to be zero because it starts at zero again and then it's going to go to one because it does it a second time and I'm going to print another star now I have all my stars and I'm done so what happened was for every number in the outer loop I'm going to hit the inner loop at minimum once and potentially it's going to roll around more times because I've got my own conditions for the inner loop so let's see okay let me let us do 481 because I want to make that do I have 481 here okay I have 482 which is fine okay so we're gonna go to 482 say okay so this is what we had before or very similar I have a number of rows and I have a number of columns and I'm going to print what I have and go from there so I have a print statement I guess just to make it an extra line and then I'm going to have four row in range one comma num rows plus one because I want to actually have the number of rows and I want to start at one now I don't have to start at one I could have started at zero and then I'm going to have the current column letter is a and now I'm going to say current call in range one num calls plus one so the number of columns plus one and then I'm going to print out everything and then here it's doing this very little care or so maybe basically this is getting the next character after a that's what that line is doing it's using an ordinal and it's using the care function plus one so it uses the ordinal of the current letter which gives it a number and then you add one which gives you the next letter in the ASCII table and then you turn it back into a care so let's roll through this real quick and I did say 482 didn't I stop and rerun do I have one up here no oh my bad duh so we're going to do three and four okay so let's take a look at this we have number of columns at four and number of rows at three so everything's always row wise when you do when you're doing a matrix so I'm going to get the first row and now I'm going to say my current column letter is a so I'm now inside my outer loop and I'm about to go inside my inner loop so I go inside my inner loop and I have Kerr call 
is range 1 to num calls plus 1. So I'm going to print 1A, step over that, it's now just changed it to B, and then see I haven't gone to the outer loop again. I'm still in the inner loop, and so now I have 1B, and it created a new cur call. So now I am 1C, and now I'm 1D. So now I am exiting the loop. So it's going to print a new line. Now I'm back to the outer loop. See, I did all of that processing in the inner loop before it even made it back to the outer loop, and the outer loop is still at 1. When I step over this, it's going to be at 2. And so now I've got cur call. It starts all over again at A because I want it to be column A. Now I step over cur call. And this is as if it never happened. You get to that inner for loop again, and it's, it's a blank slate. It's clean. Okay, it starts again at 1. So we're going to see 2A, 2B, and 2C, and 2D. So now I'm done with this. I come up here, and I've cleared the slate again for the inner loop. So now I'm going to go to 3. So I'm on row 3. I'm going to reset my column letter to A. I'm going to say cur call in range not 1 num call. So it's just as if I'm starting again. So I start at 1 again. And now I'm going to have 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D, and then I'm done. So a nested loop can do a lot of work with a little bit of code. Um, okay, no questions. Wait a minute. Let's do this. So that was nested loops. We're going to do more with less ne nested loops in module six. Um, break and continue. So let's just take a look at how break and continue work. Um, Wait a minute. There we go. This guy. So this is break, not continue. I think I have a continue example here. So this basically shows us how to break out of a pattern. So I have a user score of zero. I have a Simon pattern. And then this is a while loop that is true, which is a while loop that will run forever. It, what it's doing is it's giving you the option to continue to play until you hit the exit condition. And in this case, the exit condition happens when you hit the Simon pattern is not the same as the user pattern. So if I run this, I can show you a little more about it. 4.10... There we go. Okay. So I'm going to debug this. And I, the user pattern will just make it A. Oh, wait a minute. That's the Simon pattern. Didn't I? Okay. We're going to make that B. Okay. So now I have my score is 0, I have my Simon pattern is A, and my user pattern is B. Simon pattern is not the same as user pattern, so this is going to evaluate defaults. And I'm going to step over to break, and you know what happens? I'm done. I have a 0 user score. If I debug this again, I'm going to put in the Simon pattern is A, and I'm going to put in the other pat the user pattern whoops let's do this again lisa sorry about that okay so i am going to put in a simon pattern of a and a user pattern of a and now the simon pattern and the user pattern match so i do not hit line 19 i step over it because 
this was false, so I've added to my user score, and I go up, and it's going to wait, and I'm going to put in another A. Yay, I have a better user score. Again, I don't hit the break. I create my user score. Now I'm going to put in Z. So I step over that. Now I hit the break because this is false. I hit the break, and then I print out my score. Now, this is a really good pattern to use when you look, well, continue would be a better one to use. I need to show you continue. Okay, let's go to continue. So, um, <coughs> my apologies. Continue was very good, especially if you're checking for the validity of a user answer. Because what continue does is it stops and takes you back up to the top of the loop. So I have a string that's one and two and two. And then I'm going to create a list from that. I'm going to split it and I'm going to and it's going to have one and two and two in it. But I don't want to print out the word and. So I'm going to uh wait a minute, where am I? Oh, did it again. I keep doing that tonight. Okay. Let us go to continue. And whoops. So I have a string and now I have a list. My list has one and two and two in it. So I'm going to say for item in range len my list. Now in module two, we learn that len gives you the length of something. So that's what I want to deal with here. I want to deal with the length. So I'm going to start at zero, and I'm going to go to the length. And because it is always minus one, it will get us to the right number because we're starting at zero. So I have zero, one, two, three, four index number. I have four as my last index number, but I have I have five elements in the list, so one, two, three, four, five. So it will get me to the right place. So now I'm going to say if item is equivalent to and, which it's not because item, the first one is one, then I'm going to, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to go and I'm going to print. So I am now on the second one. Item is now one. And I'm going to print it. Item is now 2. Why isn't it doing and? Huh. 4. Oh, what did I do wrong here? Item in, oh. My bad if my, I was wondering what was wrong with that. There we go. My list of item, then print my list of item. Okay, let's do this again, and it'll do what I wanted it to do. It's not going to, to print out the ands. So let's do this again. So. I have a list called my list, and I've got five things in that list. I've got one and two and two. So item is not the item in the list. It is an index number. I should, probably should have named it index. So what I want to do is I want to compare the list value at this index number. So my list of zero is one. So it's going to print 1. And then my list at, at the, because this was 0, this is now 1, is going to not print and. So it hits continue, so it won't go to the print statement, and it goes back up to the top. And now I'm at the second place, so it's going to print 2. I'm at the third place. Guess what? It's an and. 
I'm at the fourth place, it's a number, so then I'm done. So that's how continue works. It does not allow you to keep going in the loop. It just takes you back up to the top. So if your user puts in A, B, C, D, E, because I do that for my students, when they're playing your game, um, you would want to say, is this, val is this a valid direction? If it's not a valid direction, continue. Give them a message that's so not a valid condition and then just continue and it will take you back up to the loop and let them put something else in. So that's what continue is useful for and you will be using it in your game. Um, okay, let us talk, I'm sorry we're running late again, let us talk about the pseudocode for the labs. So, we're going to be given a line of text as input and output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. Well, gee, we just did a continue that didn't do and. So you might be able to use that to, to your advantage on this one. So basically, I have, first of all, the question is, is it a finite or an infinite loop? This is a finite. So if it's finite, I'm using four. So I've got a user input and I've got this care count at zero. Now remember, pseudocode is language agnostic. So when I say set care count equal outside of the for loop, it's because it's pseudocode. It's not because it's exactly what I have to do in my code. In this case, I don't, in a Python sense, that care underscore count could just be in the for loop. That could be the variable in the for loop. But because it's pseudocode, it is language agnostic, so you have to spell out every step. You can use the shortcuts Python gives you in the lab. So, so I have for each character in user text. Then what do I want to do? Well, I can say if character is not equal to a space or period or a comma, then add it to the care count and then just go back up to the top of the loop. And then you're going to output care count. Oh, I neglected that. Let me do this really quick. Um, I'm going to change this a bit because I don't want the range here. I want to show you how to use it with my list. So here is where I just used item because I can also go through a list of things. It doesn't have to be numbers. It can simply be the actual element in the list. So in this case, let's just run this, debug this real quick. I go through this and I now have for item in my list. So instead of using the index number, I'm using the actual value in the list. So item becomes one. Item is not, um, is not equal to and, so I'm going to print it. So now item is the word and. So now I'm not going to print it. So item is the word is two, so I'm going to print it. Item is and, so I'm not going to print it. So just be, you don't have to, all I'm trying to say is you do not have to use range with four. You can use any finite list. Like we use the dictionary, you can use the finite list. So now let's go back. Sorry for jumping. Okay, so that is 4.14. And because it's finite, you use a for loop. So here, um, I'm using while just to show it to you, but you could use a for loop here too. Um, and this is just an example of how to use a while loop in pseudocode because you might have to do that at some point in time. Okay, so we're going to take the imp, um, sorry. Many user created passwords are simple and easy to guess. Write a program that takes a simple password and makes it stronger by replacing something. So an I is going to be replaced by an exclamation point and A is going to be replaced by 
the at sign, an a, a lowercase m with an uppercase m, an uppercase b with an 8, and a 0 becomes a dot. So, kind of like we did before, what we're going to do is we're going to test each of those values. So basically, I'm going to have a password. I'm going to have a use. Some, somebody's going to input a word, and I'm going to create a new password from that. And in this case, I've got counter equals zero because I'm using a while loop. But if I used a for loop, I could simply go through the for loop and the list that is in fact a string, a string is a list. You could just say, you know, character in whatever, you know, word. So what you want to do is you want to test. You want to test for each of these individual characters. You want to test for I, A, M, B, and O. And if one is those characters, then you know you have to do a replacement. So you're going to have at, you're going to be creating the password character by character by character by adding the characters together. So you're just going to say password equal password plus whatever. And if it was an I, you're going to say password is password plus exclamation point so on. Then, if nothing happens, the else will be password equal password plus whatever character you're on. And that is how you will do the replacement. You will just go through each and every character. And then at the end, you have to add QS, Q star S. So you're going to add Q star S and, buy, and print it out. So this is just an example of while in a pseudocode. You could as easily use a for loop here. And you could just remember that a string is a list, and you can walk through using in. And the printing out of the password, the Q star S and the printing out of the password are in the global scope, those last two lines. They are not in the loop. OK, so this one is a little longer, but this program will output a right triangle based on user specified height. Uh, triangle height and the symbols. So you're going to give it a character and you're going to give it how many rows. And it's a triangle, so you're not going to start, you're not going to put, print out just those numbers. You're going to start at one and then you're going to increment until you get there. So this is a multi dimensional loop. And again, I'm using while as an example, but you could easily use for. And what I've got is I've got two loops. I've got an outer loop and an inner loop. The outer loop counts the height. The inner loop counts the width. So if I have an outer loop, I'm going to say counter is less than height because, you know, maybe my height is 4. And I'm going to say inner counter equals 0. And then I'm going to check the inner counter is less than or equal to the counter that we have for the outer loop. I'm going to output the character that they gave me. Make sure to end with a space and not a new line here. And then I'm going to set inner counter equal inner counter plus one. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the inner loop. And if my inner counter is still less than or equal to the outer counter, then I keep going. If not, then I stop and I go to the outer loop. The outer loop at that point increments. It goes up by one. Um, oh, and before I go up to the top of the outer loop, I have to I have to print out a space or a new line. Sorry. So what I have to do is I have to do print, just a standard print statement like I did in the other example. You go up to the top of the loop. The counter changes, you change. You set the inner counter to zero, or you use a for loop. And then I start the inner loop again. So you have two loops. The outer loop counts the rows. The inner loop counts the columns. And if you do it like this, the inner one will increase for every row you have. So you're eventually going to get a four by four, four down and four on the bottom. Um, and I think that's it. Nope, nope, one more. Sorry about that. 
So this is just a Mad Libs. And basically what you're doing, somebody's going to provide words, um, and you're going to complete a short story. They give you the, the um, tokens. And basically what you're just going to do is you're going to replace the tokens. And while your tokens is not equal to quit. So you're going to have a word, and you're going to have some tokens. And I'm sorry, you're going to have a word, and then you're going to input tokens, but they're going to be a list, so you're going to split them. This is like what we did with my list. And then you're going to go through the tokens, and as long as the token is not quit, you're going to output eating blank tokens of zero, one, tokens of zero a day keeps the doctor away. And then you're going to ask for input and tokens again. So this is an example where you need to use the while. It is not a finite set and the user has to do input inside the loop. So user input inside the loop is going to change the outcome of the loop. So you have to use a while for 4.17 or it won't work. So Sorry I kept you guys over. Does anybody have any questions at all? Where am I? Right here. Going once. Going twice. Um, I know that's your question, but like the concept of, I guess, nested loops is still a little fuzzy for me, so I just... I think it's just going to take time to actually, like, dissect it all because it's, a, like, I got the gist of most of what you were saying, but some of it was still a little fuzzy. Okay, Jordan. Okay. I'm sorry, you broke up. What you say? I'm sorry, what was fuzzy? Um, So if you go back to, I believe, four, two slides ago, three slides ago, this one? Yeah, that one. Okay. Um, so, like, I, I understand, like, what's happening, but it's still, I guess I kind of just get confused about, like, global scope and local, local scope when it comes to, like, you know, these loops. I just forget, like, what's supposed to be counting and when and things of that nature. Okay. Well, let's. Would it help you to go through a program that's a little similar to this, that maybe we change one of them and do an if inside of it so you can... Yeah, for sure. Out? Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. So um, that's there. So do I have a better one? Four with range. Index out of bounds. Oh, I forgot to show you this one. But I'll show you that in a minute. Nested for, nested while, nested for. Is the nested loops, oops, don't look at that one. Um, I don't even have that one. So is this one kind of good, or do you want to go to one with like a more for loop? Um, this one's good. Okay. Because I can go, I can go right one real quick. If you no, this one, this one's good. Okay. So let's go back and run this. Four ten. Is that it? Or ten one. Okay. So let's talk about scope for a minute. Because he, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make this a little bigger, but it doesn't seem to want to play well in the sandbox. There we go. So we know that this is global scope. Right. We know that sixteen is a global scope. Correct. Now everything line seventeen through twenty is the local scope of the while loop. Right. However, line 19 is a local scope for the if. So, okay. 
that you have to make sure that you have the right number of local scopes for the right um, the right type of branch. So if I did that, I've got a syntax error. I tried to run it. I get my nasty syntax error, indentation error expected, and indentation block. So PyCharm has told us that this is wrong. It's not indented. Now, I could make two choices. I could not indent it at all. I could take it all the way back, or I could take it forward. So I just took it all the way back, and if I try and run it, I have another indentation error. Because this is not in the global scope. This can't be in the global scope. It's the line right underneath the if statement. And the only place I can put it is under the if. Now, let's look at what would eventually be a logic error. Right now I have user score and user score, if you look at the justification for it, user score is in the local scope of the while loop, not of the if, because if user score was in the local scope of the if statement, it would have to be justified with break. It would have to be like this, and it wouldn't work right. And we can look at that in just a second. But that, because I moved user score to the right, one tab stop. I have now moved it into the local scope of the if statement. So let's do this. Let's run this. So I am going to actually debug it. And so the first thing I do is I'm going to put in A. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in another A. Now, it says here, if Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern, then I break. Otherwise, I should increment my score, but I don't. I go back up to the input statement, and I'm going to input another A, and I go to this. Now, I'm not, I'm not incrementing a score at all. Score, if I look at it, I can look at it in the debugger, it's zero. I can mouse over it here, it's zero. I can mouse over it here, it's zero. This is a logic error because it is in the wrong scope. There's nothing syntactically wrong with this program. We don't get any, any exceptions. I don't get any little wiggles. But it's not working. And it's not working because of scope. So what I have to do is I have to understand, and what I have to do is I have to move it. Okay, I want this to happen when this, when this is false. So I could put an else there, or I could just move it back. Yeah. Put it back. So this is now inside the um, local scope of the while loop. So let's see what happens when I debug it now. Um, I'm going to put in A. I'm going to put in A. And now I get here. And A is, in fact, equal to A. So this is going to evaluate to false. I step over, and now I get to increment my score because the patterns do match. So I'm going to wait for this. I'm going to say A. Again, the patterns match, so I get to increase my score. And then I'm going to say B or G or whatever. The patterns don't match, so I break. Now, once I break, once I'm all done with this, I then go and... I am in the back into the global scope. So the next thing, the next line in the global scope is what's going to happen, and that's going to print the score. Now, I can use user score in the global scope. I can use this variable in the global scope because I defined it in the global scope. If I had done 
let's just say us equals one. If I had done that and decided to use us here, let's see what would happen. Let me just run it. And I'm going to put in A and A. And then I'm going to put in B. And it says user score is 1. Why did it do that? It shouldn't have. Anyway. Oh, maybe it was down here. Yeah. So that didn't illustrate what I wanted it to illustrate. I'm not quite sure why. I'll have to go back. Sorry. Brain shuts down at 10. Um, let's see. Equal to. It still shouldn't print Q there. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, I haven't done. This should be a syntax error right now. Because of the uppercase, correct? No, because this is it was defined in the wrong scope. Oh, yeah. Okay. This should be this should be red squiggles, and I don't know why it isn't. Cuz that should have been defined in the global scope with the outer loop, right? Yes. If if I wanted to be able to use it in the outer scope, it should be defined in the outer scope. So I don't so know why, why why PyCharm is letting this run. So if it was correct, you would need us would need to be all the way back with the initial while statement, right? That's right. Us would need to be out here. Okay. We have to find the while statement. Okay. And then it should be fine. But I put it inside. And it wasn't. So I will have to go find that out and answer that question. I put it here, and it should have not allowed me to do this. And there's no other us defined. So I'll change this back. That was my fancy dancy. Um, and I think sometimes I get, because I'm a very... Uh, not linear person, but I, I like seeing things like in order. Yeah. So I, I think sometimes like, you know, like you just did with like how you can, you know, have print statements certain places and then like you can define variables. Like it's, it's not always like in order, even yeah. though like, it's kind of, I, I think that's throwing me off sometimes too. Okay. Um, so is this helpful? Yes, it is. That was definitely helpful. Good. Do you want to go over anything else? Um, I don't know. I think I think while loops are just gonna have to make sense in my head. Like I I get them, but then like once it comes to like solving a problem, it's it kind of gets a little fuzzy. But I'll just have to get there. My suggestion is you give yourself the opportunity to play with them. Right. As these problems get longer, it's harder and harder for um, it gets harder and harder to be to to solve them as the first two weeks. Right. And what I might recommend a student is baby steps. Don't solve the whole problem at first. In fact, you might even, not even want to write it in Zybooks first. Right. You might want to start by writing it in PyCharm. Right. And so what I suggest is if you have a problem like this that's longer, write it in PyCharm and start with just the outer loop, probably a for loop, mm -hmm. and one if statement. Okay? Because you've got global scope is while, the f is inside, the local scope is a while, and then the set has got to be inside the local scope of this if statement. Right. And that's all you write in PyCharm. And, and I guess my suggestion is make this a for loop so you don't have to worry about anything infinite. And mm -hmm. then test it. So if I is there first, what you want to do is you wanna, your input should be like three I's. 
Right. And if they all get changed to exclamation points, you know the eyes work. And if they don't all get changed to exclamation points, then you've got to figure out what that is. But it's a much shorter thing to figure out than if you've written all this code. So kind of, like, I think they would prefer to do it as like incremental. Yeah, it's incremental. It's baby steps. That's what I call it, is baby steps. Right. So you just do it as incremental as possible, and it will save you time. I think most people think that I'm crazy. It's most students think that I'm crazy. Most people who develop, unless they are, you know, unless they've got a real computer for a brain, um, do it this way. Most of the people I work with do it this way. So that's what you do. You want to take it in small increments. You want to use the tools available, which is PyCharm, because you can't do this in Zybooks. Zybooks will just give you a bunch of errors. Right. But you can do it in PyCharm. And then you're the one who's doing the input to test. And just type things and test it. And if it comes out fine for that particular character, then you've got that one down, and then you move to the next one, and then you move to the next one. And you do that until you've got all the characters, and then at the end, you do whatever the else needs to happen, and then you go and you go back out to the global scope. Right. So that is my suggestion. Yeah, yeah that's very helpful. Thank you. I don't solve complex problems by writing complex code. Right. I solve complex problems by writing little bits of code at a time and testing it. Makes sense. Thanks so much. No problem. Does anybody have any other questions? Going once. Zach, I see you joined a bit late. We're about to end, but I will have this up uh, on my YouTube channel, hopefully tomorrow. Um, if not, the worst will be Saturday, but I'm really hoping I'll be able to do it tomorrow. So I'm going to say have a good night to everybody. And um, if you're in my class, please feel free to contact me. I'm going to stop the recording.